περάσουμε τώρα στο επόμενο θέμα, το οποίο αφορά στην τρίτη διάλεξη του 17ου κύκλου διαλέξεων του Αλεύθερου Πανεπιστήμιου στην Ομογένεια του Λονδίνου. Η συγητή ήταν ο Παναγιώτη Ξενοφόντο, καθηγητή του Πανεπιστήμιου τη Οξφόρδη. Η διάλεξη έλαβε χώρα στο οίκημα τη αδελφότητα και το Hellenic TV ήταν εκεί, όπω πάντα, ω χορηγό επικοινωνία για να καταγράψει την διάλεξη αυτή. Την εκδήλωση άνοιξε ο γραμματέα τη Εθνική Κυπριακή Ομοσπονδία, Ανδρέα Καραολή, ο οποίο αφού καλωσόρισε του παρευρισκόμενου και τον διακεκριμένο επιστήμονα Παναγιώτη Ξενοφόντο, τον παρουσίασε στο κοινό και διάβασε το πλούσιο βιογραφικό του. Α παρακολουθήσουμε τον κύριο Καραολή. Του Ελεύθερου Πανεπιστημίου για την Ομογένεια του Λονδίνου. Ε, άρχισα πριν λίγα λεπτά να χαμογελώ. Όσοι με θυμούνται να στέκομαι εδώ, δεν στέκομουν πάντοτε με το ίδιο νύφος. Χαίρομαι ιδιαίτερα γιατί έχουμε αρκετή νεολαία απόψε μαζί μας και ελπίζω και αναμένω ότι θα τους έχουμε και σε επόμενες διαλέξεις. Όπως είπαμε, στο πρόγραμμα του Πανεπιστημίου της Κύπρου θα έχουμε διαλέξεις στα αγγλικά, ειδικά για την νεολαία μας. Γιατί θέλουμε την νεολαία να έρθει πιο κοντά μας και ιδιαίτερα να στρατολογηθεί στον αγώνα για τη διατήρηση της ταυτότητας της παρεγγίας μας και για τη συνέχιση του σκληρού αγώνα που διεξάγει ο κυπριακός λαός και η παροικία μας για την ελευθερία της Κύπρου από τα τουρκικά στρατεύματα κατοχής. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ ιδιαίτερα την νεολαία και βέβαια τους τακτικούς φοιτητές του Ελεύθερου Πανεπιστημίου για την Ομογένεια του Λονδίνου. Ο, ο μιλητής μας απόψε είναι ένας νέος της δεύτερης γενεάς της παρεγγίας μας, ο οποίος γεννήθηκε και μεγάλωσε εδώ, φίτησε στα ελληνικά μας σχολεία, τελείωσε το πανεπιστήμιο και τώρα σε λίγο χρόνο θα δώσει τις εξετάσεις, εξετάσεις του για PhD στη Ρωσική Φιλολογία στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Οξφόρδης. Αλλά όμως η αγάπη του για τα ελληνικά και θέλω να πιστεύω ότι προήλθε από τους δασκάλους του στο ελληνικό σχολείο τον έκανε να ασχοληθεί και με τον έναν από τους μεγαλύτερους ποιητές της Ελλάδας, τον Κωνσταντίνο Καβάφη. Ε, δεν εδιάβασε Καβάφη, μπορώ να πω ότι εμελέτησε τον Καβάφη και έλαβε μέρος σε σεμινάρια στην Ελλάδα και, και αλλού και μίλησε ο ίδιος για τον Καβάφη. Ε, εκτός από αυτά, ο νεαρός Παναγιώτης έχει και το κυπριακό φιλότιμο. Όταν επισκέπτεται τη Ρωσία σαν μελετητής της ρωσικής γλώσσας, ε, ε, δημιούργησε εκεί ομάδες ο ίδιος ε, νέων και φοιτητών των πανεπιστημίων, ακόμη και λεκτόρων και συζητούν για την ρωσική γλώσσα. Ακόμη ε, δημιούργησε ομάδες για να διδάσκουν φτωχά και παιδιά που δεν έχουν τους πόρους να φοιτήσουν στα σχολεία και ακόμη ε, ε, δημιούργησε μία φιλανθρωπική οργάνωση ε, για να βοηθά παιδιά να σπουδάζουν. Αυτά 
στη μακρινή Ρωσία από έναν νεαρό Κύπριο του Λονδίνου. Το συγχαίρουμε τον Παναγιώτη και του ευχόμαστε σε ακόμα μεγαλύτερες επιτυχίες. Και τον καλούμε να μας μιλήσει απόψε για τον Καβάφη. Αμέσω μετά τον λόγο έλαβε ο εισηγητή τη βραδιά Παναγιώτη Ξανοφόντο, ο οποίο είναι καθηγητή στο Πανεπιστήμιο τη Οξφόρδη και ευχαρίστησε και αυτό με τη σειρά του του διοργανωτέ του Ελεύθερου Πανεπιστήμιου, την Εθνική Κυπριακή Ομοσπονδία και τον πρόεδρο τη Κύριο Καραολή, τον πρόεδρο τη Νεπόμακ Χρήστο Τουιτών και τον πρόεδρο τη Νεπόμακ UK Κωνσταντίνο Αλεξάνδρου για την πρόσκληση που έκανα να μιλήσει για το σημαντικό θέμα το οποίο ήταν οι προσανατολισμοί του Κωνσταντίνου Καβάφη. Η διάλεξη έγινε στην αγγλική γλώσσα έτσι ώστε να γίνει κατανοητή και στους νεαρούς οι οποίοι δεν κατανοούν καλά την ελληνική γλώσσα. Στο βίντεο που ακολουθεί θα σας παρουσιάσουμε ένα απόσπασμα από αυτήν την αναλυτική διάλεξη του Παναγιώτη Ξανοφόντος. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ στον κύριο Αντρά για αυτά τα θερμά τα λόγια ε, στο Brotherhood, στο Federation και, στο, ε, και στην ΕΠΟΜΑΚ ειδικά τον κύριο Χρήστον Καραολή για την πρόσκληση να μιλήσω μαζί σας σήμερα για τον Καβάφη. Ε, θα μιλήσω στα αγγλικά, ε, αλλά βέβαια στο τέλος, αν θέλετε, έχετε κάποιες ερωτήσεις στα ελληνικά, δεν είναι, δεν είναι θέμα. Ε, και ελπίζω να είναι μια ενδιαφέρουσα συζήτηση μαζί σας. Οκ, okay. so, um, the main question that I'm asking myself tonight and, and, and kind of trying to pose to you is why is Gavafi readable and re-readable? Um, I wanted to start off with um, some not very academic research. So, um, the first is a story and the second is a picture. Firstly, the story. Um, in preparation for this talk, I asked some friends in Greece, Cyprus, and elsewhere which modern Greek writers they knew. There were two answers, pretty much only two answers. One of them was Gavafi, and the other one was uh, no one. So we have a choice between Gavafi and no one. Um, the, second, the second situation is a bit kind of stranger. And I wanted to kind of show you again. This seems a bit bizarre, but I will show you why I think this, kind of, um, this is interesting. Um, it's a picture of some cinnamon rolls, which was posted on Instagram um, about six months ago. Now, obviously, it looks a bit bizarre. Why, why am I talking to you about cinnamon rolls in a speech about a 20th century uh, poet? Um, on the right-hand side, it's been tagged, Stiskalis, uh, hashtag Gavafi. And then the, the, the writer, well, the person who's posted it has posted a poem, which is kind of a bizarre poem, um, to accompany this photo. But it's posted it and posted it on Instagram. So really, these are the kind of questions that I've been asking. How do we get to the position where wherever you ask, whoever you ask, you get the, the same answer? Which, which Greek writers do you know? And they say Gavafi. And secondly, how do we get to the stage where we have pictures of cinnamon rolls and, and kind of Instagram um, posts which are based or, or, or kind of surrounding the poet? Um, so in this talk, I'm going to be concentrating um, not on the popularity of Gavafi and his reception, um, but on the reasons, as I said, why we can read his texts and have continued to reread them many times over, um, both in Greece, Cyprus, in the Greek-speaking world, and abroad. Um, I'm interested not just in the rereading of Gavafi, um, but also in the, re the reading, re reading of Gavafi's text, but also in the rereading of Gavafi. Um, he's a poet who has, for many reasons, um, been of interest for his biography. Um, people are interested in his personal documents, his photographs, and these have been read with, with as much interest as his poetry. Um, so there have been hundreds of critical articles on the different interpretations of Gavafi's life and works, but very little analysis on um, why these interpretations have come up in the first place. So that, that's kind of the main issue that I'm trying to kind of tackle today. Um, the argument that I would like to develop is one based on gaps. So I'm using the word gaps here, both literally and metaphorically, to show how various empty spaces and omissions are inherent in innumerable aspects of the poet's life and works. So in these gaps, the reader is able and invited indeed to read that which he wishes and to imaginatively create personal views of how these spaces should be filled up. In their variations, ranging from all ends of the social, political, sexual and cultural spectrums, these interpretations in turn engender further debates as there are often huge differences between the individual interpretations. Um, an ex-professor at Oxford, Peter Mackridge, emeritus of Greek, um, has noted that Gavafi's poetic text can be read in many different ways due to the in-betweenness of his poetic voice. Um, and here's, the, here's a quote from Mackridge. In his poetry, he, Gavafi, often adopts a betwixt and between position. In other words, he's a, he, he chooses a position which is in the middle. 
Um, many of his characters are betwixt and between in their ethnic, religious, and sexual identities, while he himself was betwixt and between in his use of language, metre, and rhyme. What I wish to emphasize, however, is that these various instances of in-betweenness extend to the study of Gavafi as a whole. And these are created by gaps, empty spaces, um, in the poet's biography and text. So that, that's kind of what I want to look at today. Um, the discussion is going to be into two parts, going to be split into two parts. In the first, I will expand on the idea of gaps to explain how um, some of the various readings that have taken place over the last um, 100 years and beyond can be explained through this idea of gaps. Um, and I will you know, talk a little bit about his biography and give a broad overview of some critical positions. In the second part, I'd like to talk about how these gaps are also on the level of the text, so the poetic text. And I've given you um, three texts to, to look at. Just a very small kind of caveat here. Um, I don't have time to allude to all the critical debates surrounding the poet, and any omissions that I make are not to be read as criticisms of the, of the works of others, but simply they, they, they've just been chosen, um, they just haven't been discussed, or I won't discuss them due to issues related to time. So let's begin with his biography. Um, on paper, his life was um, pretty uneventful and kind of boring when you reread it for different reasons. Um, Costandinos Pedro Gavafi was born on the 29th of April, 1863, and he died on his birthday 70 years later. So he was exactly uh, 70 years old when he died. Um, he was the last of nine children um, to be born into a well-off Greek merchant family in the city of Alexandria in Egypt, a city where he would live um, for the majority of his life and the city where he would die. His father, Pedros, passed away when he was aged, um, when Gavafi was aged, uh, Costantinos was aged seven, and the family trading business which um, his father ran collapsed soon after, soon after his death. Um, Gavafi spent many years in the 1870s living in, um, 1870s and 80s living in England. He lived in London and also in, um, slightly bizarrely now, Liverpool. Um, at the time, it was a, a very kind of important merchant port. Um, and also in Constantinople. Uh, the poet held a clerical job in the irrigation office of the Egyptian government for 30 years. Again, kind of a bizarre, a, a bizarre kind of um, detail um, in the life of a poet. Um, he only visited Greece a few times for tourist reasons and made a final visit there a year before his death in 1932. Um, this was in an attempt to cure his throat cancer. He died of, um, this is the illness from which he would die um, uh, subsequently. So in this kind of brief overview of his biography, I also wanted to if we return to our discussion of gaps, emphasize that there's much that we do not know and we will never know about the poet. This is evidenced in the fullest English biography um, that we have, which is Gavafi, a critical biography by Robert um, Liddell from 1974. When we read this text, we realize that any biographer is confronted with gaps and black spots in the poet's life. There are times um, and events about which we have no information. Many of these gaps will be filled in by a new biography that's coming out um, probably 2020, 2021, um, by the American academics, uh, Gregory Justanus and Peter Jeffries. Even though this book, the, the new biography, will benefit from the opening of Gavafi's archive, it's a, the archive is a separate issue which I'll discuss in a bit, there are still many issues related to his life that are not documented. So um, when he was in England in Constantinople, for example, we don't, we don't know very much about what he did there and, and, and what he was up to. Uh, we also know very little about um, his lovers or potential lovers. Um, he begins to write poetry in the 1880s and he wrote up until the very end of his life. He was fluent in English and had an excellent command of French, though he wrote all his poetry, well, nearly all his poetry in, in Greek. Um, this Greek has been noted by critics over the years for its combination of um, both Katharevusa and Vimodiki forms of, of the Greek language. During his life, um, he never published his collected works, but he did publish and distribute, num uh, distribute numerous collections of poems. Um, his preferred way of publishing was predominantly by selecting certain poems and sending them either individually or collectively to individuals. So what he would do was he would write poetry, finish um, finish finish his poems, and keep them in different parts of his house. And then when he would send it to Mr. X, for example, he would choose one or two poems from each collection, put them together, staple them together, um, not staple them together, pin them together, and then send them off. So it's kind of, kind of like a customized way of, of presenting, um, presenting your work. So in this way, he created these kind of unique collections. Um, and each edition and, and print run was, was slightly different from, from the other. So we have an issue here already with, with this idea of canonical text and what the canonical text actually is. 
because there, there are slight variations in, in, in editions and text themselves. Over time, he used to, for example, slightly revise and change certain aspects of his text as well. Um, much work has been carried out in, 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 in the UK and, and in Greece and, and abroad um, on the intricacies of his publishing process. Um, two, two academics are probably Anthony Hurst and Sarah Dawi, um, that I would kind of I would kind of underline here. Um, and re more recently, there's um, an academic called William Strobel who's provided some clarity on his printing processes. Um, here's a quick quote from Strobel here. His control, so Gavafi's control of the poem's textual production is practically unrivaled in the 20th century. During his, during his lifetime, he was the writer, editor, designer, binder, publisher, distributor, and at times censor of his own poems. So we have this kind of jack of all trades who is, who is the poet himself as well. The first collected edition of his works was published in 1935 by Rika Singobulu. Um, and it was made up of 153 poems that Gavafi published in his lifetime in various forms, as well as the final poem which he, he finalized for printing, um, which is called On the Outskirts of Antioch, Hista Perejora de Antiochias, from 1933. These poems were published in chronological order by Singobulu, um, something that Gavafi, as we've mentioned, never really did himself. Um, due to his methods of publishing, printing, the printing of such an edition was always to be bound up with certain problems um, and issues related to the poet's individual papers and his archive. Um, so I just wanted to give you kind of a few words about the archive. Um, Sengobulo was the, so Rika, was, Rika Sengobulo was the wife of Aleko Sengobulos, who was the literary heir of Gavafi's um, papers and works. George Savidis, in many ways the most important Gavafi scholar of the 20th century, was shown this archive in 1961 and became its owner, in, um, became its owner eight years later. He would work on it until his death in 1995. The archive then went on to uh, George Savidi's son, Manolis, um, who subsequently sold it in 2012 to the Anassis Foundation in Athens. Um, during his years of scholarship, George would publish a new edition of the 154 poems, as well as publish and help publish various editions of Gavafi's repudiated poems, unpublished poems, and unfinished poems. Gavafi was therefore uncovered and discovered many times over um, during the 20th century. Um, and this process was, was kind of intimately tied up with the poet's personal papers. So where, do the issue of, where does the issue of gaps fit in, fit in here? Well, there have been gaps in between um, the publication of these different documents from the Gavaf, Gavafi archive, um, which have resulted in these kind of um, reassessments of the poet over time as these new documents um, have come to life and have been published. I just wanted to kind of briefly mention a couple of debates relating to the poet in academic circles before we... Um, move on to um, looking at the poems themselves. Um, there have been, over the 20th century, over the course of the 20th century, there have been several interpretations initiated um, by some of the most important Greek literary critics and writers uh, relating to Gavafi. So um, some, just some names that you might have heard of. Dimos Malanos um, looked at Gavafi through the lens of kind of Freudian psychoanalysis. Stradis Tsirkas saw him as this kind of pseudo-Marxist revolutionary. Uh, Seferis depicts him as, in, in, with, with, again, some caveats, with some, with, as a kind of national poet, a poet of Greece. So the, 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 as you can see, there are kind of different, I mean, how can you be a nationalist and a Marxist at the same time? There, there are kind of confusions here. Um, so what happens is that each of these writers takes the poet and his works and makes them their own. Um, they're analysing the same materials, but they're coming to different conclusions. Um, in a more academic setting, um, I would say that Gavafi has led to wider discussions, or through Gavafi, we've had wider discussions on Greek criticism, its role and, uh, in the world, and you know, themes and issues internally within Greek literary criticism and Greek philology um, on a university level, both in Greece and abroad. Um, just wanted to quickly give you one example. Um, in 1983, there was a discussion in a journal called um, the Journal of the Hellenic Diaspora, um, and this was between a US-based academic, Vasilis Labrobulos, and a UK-based academic, um, Roderick Beaton. Um, Lambrobulos, in a reading of, of one of Gavafi's poems, um, he, he comes to a kind of a strange conclusion, which, again, don't worry if it's a bit dense. It's, it's, uh, there, it, it makes sense when you think about it. Um, so what Lambrobulos says is that my interpretation of this poem is a hermeneutical interpretation, a political interpretation of interpretations, an interpretive resistance against the domineering interpretations and interp interpolation of inter interpenetrations and interrogation of interrelations and interspersion of interpersonal intersections. Um, 
I will get to the kind of the more general public's uh, view of Gaddafi in, in a bit as well. Um, Beaton, Beaton would criticise this view. It's kind of a very pro-structuralist pro view. It's, it's actually it's an incredible article. It's, it's, if you're interested in it, it's really worth um, getting hold of that. And also Beaton's response, which is really interesting. Um, so Beaton would then say that Lambrobolus' approach um, was, was kind of was wrong for different reasons. So we, have, we end up having this debate of what Greek liter literary criticism should be, where it should stand, how it should function, all through um, Gavafi and the Gavafian texts. So he's stimulating new conversations. Um, and the critical positions that are taken up, so Lambrobolos versus Beaton, for example, um, they, have, they have huge, huge gaps, going back to the topic that I was discussing before, in between them. Gaps that are quite difficult to bridge. Just two more um, very quick discussions, more recent discussions about Gavafi. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to get to the kind of um, the textual analysis itself. Um, two, two discussions that I think should be underlined. Um, one um, is regarding the social circumstances in which he wrote. So what was Alexandria like when Gavafi was writing? Um, what was his position in that, in that city and in that country um, of Egypt? Um, a discussion has uh, been taking place recently um, through Hala Khalim's book uh, from 2013 called Alexandrian Cosmopolitanism and Archive. And she's been discussing these, these kind of issues. And seeing Gavafi as both an Egyptian and a Greek. So um, we kind of, especially in Greece and Cyprus, think of Gavafi as a Greek writer, which of course for many, and in many ways he is. But I think sometimes we forget that he, was, he lived all his life in, in a non-Greek country, if that makes, um, if we can say that. Um, even though Alexandria did have quite a few cosmopolitan aspects, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't mainland Greece. So Khalim takes this kind of argument um, uh, against kind of making, uh, she, she counters a Eurocentric argument on Gavafi, basically. It's, it's, it's a worthy book. Um, another debate that's been spotlighted has surrounded uh, the poet's sexuality. Um, in debates begun in many ways in the 80s by Margaret Alexiou and Peter, uh, Peter Bean, among others, again, academic circles, um, recent scholars have sought to use queer theory and contemporary theories of sexuality to reassess, reassess the homosexual themes, traits, and positions in Gavafi's um, poems. Um, Dimitris Baba Nicolaou at Oxford um, has done a lot of uh, work on these issues, and he's provoked much um, positive conversation on this. Again, these are, of course, not the only debates surrounding the poet that are currently ongoing, and uh, merely point to the fact that there are many avenues in his life that are still waiting to be understood, probed, delved into. In many ways, however, as I've been trying to um, hint, the issue at hand is not why literary critics and academics read Gavafi, read and reread him, developing new assessments over time, but how and why does, um, does the non-critic, does the non-academic read and reread Gavafi's life and his texts? His appeal in the Greek and non-Greek speaking world is, is pretty, pretty astonishing. Um, he's been translated in, in many languages several times over, so I think in English there are, I think, at least 15 uh, different translations of his canonical texts. Um, he's been alluded to and discussed by some of the well, most well-known writers of the 20th century. He's had films made about him um, and about his, about his life, about his poetry. And on the 150-year 150, uh, 150 anniversary of the poet's birth in 2013, 2013 there was in many ways a crystallization of, of this kind of canonization as, as the Greek writer, as the Greek poet, both nationally and internationally. Um, and people have been discovering and, and thinking recently more about how his works and his literary myth appear in our daily lives. So I just wanted to kind of take a small kind of detour here and just show you some examples of how he appeals to the wider public to give some evidence of his, his kind of relevance or prevalence um, in today's world. Um, I just wanted to give a few, so I started a little bit at the start with, with Instagram, but now I wanted to kind of go into the other direction and look at Twitter. Um, so what I've done is I've just kind of pulled together a few kind of examples of, of what I mean. So I ran a search in Twitter um, with the word Gavafi in Greek. And here are just, just three of the examples. So the first person says, some call it poetry, I name it psychotherapy, with a love heart emoji, hashtag Gavafi, hashtag life coaching. Okay, so someone's obviously um, uh, finding some sort of inspiration in his works for how to lead their lives. Um, the second one is, is kind of a strange one, and I worry for the person that wrote it, I think they're, they're a bit down. Mono Gavafi, tipo talo, elinico, den antejo na diovaso, miseriazo, with this kind of kind of strange emoji face, not quite happy or not quite sad. Um, so only Gavafi, I can't stand, can't stand reading any other Greek, I'm in a miserable state. Um, the third one was 
above, and these are all recent posts, these have all been posted about um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, over the last two to three weeks. The last one was by, um, it was a couple, there was a picture of a couple, um, and the woman was wearing a bikini, and the guy was in his swimming trunks, and they were swimming together and, and holding each other and kissing. And then there was this above that photo. So they posted it on their own, on their own um, profile, on their own Twitter. I'm, I'm, again, I'm not, that quotation I don't even think is from Gavafis. I'm a bit confused. Um, so only love has remained. Fight so they don't take this away from us too. A good day to all. Ολόκληρη τη διάλεξη θα σας την παρουσιάσουμε προσεχώς στην εκπομπή με το φακό του Hellenic TV.